right, so so far we've talked a lot about our brain growth and our brain specialization, but it's important to acknowledge one thing that's essential for our brain, and that is sleep. So sleep is essential because it helps our brain to develop. It helps to reinforce those synapses. But we also know that in terms of our physical growth, sleep is a time when most of that happens. In fact, 80% of our human growth hormone is released during our sleep. We also know that having an adequate amount of sleep helps with things like our concentration, our mood, our energy levels. And that lack of sleep can result in mood disturbances and even be associated with a major depressive episode. Finally, we also know that sleep is essential to our metabolism and the lack of sleep has been associated with higher body weight and weight gain because we often overeat when we're overtired. So sleep is absolutely essential. And one thing that's really key here is that infants know this and infants will prioritize it. On average, we find that infants sleep the majority of their days on about 16 and a half hours a day. Though there are some individual variances. Some infants will sleep up to 21 hours and some infants are actually awake for a big chunk of the day and only sleep for 10 hours. But one thing is important, they are growing and they are developing while they're asleep. It's not a battery off scenario. An infant's brain is doing most of the work while they're asleep. By the time a newborn is now four months of age, they start to have closer to adult patterns, meaning they tend to sleep more at night, they tend to be awake more at day, but it is pretty common for a four month old still to have about three naps during the daytime. Once we get to preschoolers, three year olds tend to sleep for about half their day. It's important for them to have about 12 hours of sleep a day. Now that can come in form of one or two naps as well. By age seven, we're now talking about elementary age kids. It's important for them to get about 10 hours of sleep at night. By the time we're talking about adolescents, eight hours of sleep at night is good. And eight hours of sleep is recommended for adolescents, immersion adults and adults. However, adults that have reached that menopause andropause stage tend to not be able to sleep as much. Even if they desire sleep, their body tends to need less of it. And for especially older adults, they may find that their body can't sleep more than five hours. One of the many things going on here is because sleep is essential for producing our human growth hormone, we are producing less of human growth hormone in our elder years. Once we get to adulthood, we still produce human growth hormone as that's essential for helping to heal our wounds and keep our body tissues repaired. However, once we become elders, it's important to understand that our body is actually not so good at repairing our injuries. And that's because our human growth hormone is really dropping off. And because we're not producing that, our body doesn't need as much sleep. This might be a great time to get a great grandparent to babysit a newborn because they may have no problem staying up throughout the night with the newborn infant. Another perk of multi-generational homes. Now sleep is extremely important to newborn infants. However, we have to talk about something that is very tragic and that can happen during the sleep of a newborn. And that is SIDS. It stands for Sudden Infant Death Syndrome. And what happens here without any symptoms, with any predictors, an infant will suddenly die in their sleep. But this is sometimes called crib death. And this is the idea that a very happy, very alert infant went down for a nap and never woke up again. We tend to find this happens more often between the ages of two months and four months, though it can happen at younger and older ages than that. And as we're learning more about SIDS, we're finding that more commonly, what happens is this is a stage where a lot of the infant reflexes are starting to be pruned. We talked about the synaptic pruning, and this is the idea that infants born with many reflexes. One inflex is the idea that if there's a little blanket next to their mouth, when they're just a very, very newborn, they'll have the reflex to move their head away. That involuntary reflex gets pruned. And sometime after four months, they get the voluntary movement to move their head. But between the ages of two months and four months, they don't have the involuntary reflex and they don't have the voluntary muscle strength to move their head away from a blanket. So in this instance, a lot of SIDS deaths may be suffocation deaths. It may be that there is a blanket or a stuffed animal in the way that is suffocating the infant. Because of this, we really strongly recommend that infants do not have any blankets or stuffed animals or lots of toys in their crib or bassinet while they're sleeping. We also know that there's some instances where there seems to be a neurological atypicality 
in the hindbrain of these infants. In that brain stem, in one area known as the reticular formation, this is where our brain allows us to be awake or fall asleep. There seems to be a neurological atypicality there and that it's not a suffocation hazard. It was just hardwired in that the infant wasn't going to be able to make it. And it was, uh, and it was an undiagnosed atypicality that was going to result in their death no matter what the parents did. However, there's a lot of cases of SIDS that aren't caused by suffocation and aren't caused by this reticular formation atypicality. Most cases of SIDS still today are unknown. We don't know what causes them. And because of this, although correlation is not causation, researchers and public health officials have looked to lots of correlations to try and identify some risk and protective factors. Now, although when I was born, the current recommendation was to put infants to sleep on their tummies so that if they spit up, they wouldn't choke on their spit. Since the 1990s, it's been recommended that we put infants to bed on their backs and always on their backs. And that's because we found by putting infants to bed on their backs, we've actually reduced the incidence of SIDS in Canada by one half. For some reason, infants tend to die of SIDS more often when they're put to bed on their tummies. We also tend to find that infants tend to die of SIDS more often when there is secondhand smoke in their home, when there is someone who smokes cigarettes in their home, or when their crib mattress or their blankets have been exposed to cigarette smoke. And this one is more controversial, but we have found that in North American homes, parents who co-sleep with their infants may be at a higher incidence of SIDS. And that's because if a parent rolls over on a very petite infant, and blocks off their air passage or is sleeping with blankets and the blankets become over the chin or over the mouth and nose of the infant, that may also pose a risk. However, we know that co-sleeping has happened around the world for millennia and has actually been a good thing. And that outside North America, we know that many parents co-sleep with their infants and it's a very positive experience and a very healthful experience. So currently in Canada, a lot of healthcare providers suggest no co-sleeping whatsoever, no sleeping on an infant's tummies whatsoever, and being very cautious. However, we know there's lots of infants out there who maybe have acid reflux and can't sleep on their backs because they'll have a heartburn or maybe only want to sleep next to their parents. That's because of this, it becomes a very controversial issue. What's not controversial about this and what there is very sound agreement on is that if a parent is going to co-sleep with an infant, they should only co-sleep if they are not taking any sedatives, not intoxicated with alcohol or any other substances. And that's because if they're intoxicated with any sleeping aids such as alcohol or sleeping pills or, or narcotics, they may not wake up and they may be more likely to roll over on the infant. So if they're sober, that's a really good thing. It's also been shown that parents that gave birth to the infant, the birthing process releases a lot of hormones that are really beneficial that allow them to be more mindful and have a lighter sleep so that they'll wake up when the infant moves. In comparison, the other parent, the dad or the co-parent or siblings don't release those hormones and they're more likely to roll over or put a blanket over the infant's face. So for most cases, a mom who is sober tends to be a lower risk for co-sleeping than or a parent who has been drinking lots of alcohol, for instance. That being said, co-sleeping is still a major controversy in North America with lots of sleep experts actually advising against it and instead advising a phenomenon known as cry it out. So cry it out is when an infant is placed in their own crib, in their own room, and they are taught to self-soothe by crying themselves to sleep. Cry it out is also very controversial, with many parents saying no, they'd rather rock their infants to sleep, or co-sleep with them, or cuddle them until they fall asleep, and then put them down. So there's lots of controversial approaches. In addition, there's controversy over whether we should be sleep training infants or trying to teach them how to sleep at all, or whether we should just be letting them do what feels natural to them and the parent, and through cuddling. So although sleeping is a very essential part of our life, it remains pretty unknown in terms of how to do it best. Should we sleep and cuddle our infant to sleep? Should we put them in their own bed, in their own room and let them cry it out? There's still, we still need lots of research in this area.